Psalm chapter 37. Psalm chapter 37. We've got two more weeks of summer in the Psalms. Summer in the Psalms is about to turn into September in the Psalms. And it's been a great, great series. Next week, I'm really excited. We're going to close it out by looking at Psalm 23, one of the most beloved chapters in the entire Bible, where we look at the Lord as our shepherd. And we're going to talk about how Jesus, our Savior, is a shepherd that leads us. So I'm super excited about that. But as we look at Psalm chapter 37 uh, this morning, I want to introduce it by talking about one of my all-time favorite books. I like to read a lot. Um, sometimes I read history. Sometimes I read biography. But one of my very favorite books ever is this one. It is Children's Letters to God. It's a collection of prayers, observations, questions, complaints, and all of it is preserved in the handwriting and the language uh, and the grammar that the children have who, uh, who submitted these. And uh, just incredible stuff. Uh, God, dear God, when you made the first man, did he work as good as we do now? Tom. <laughs> Dear God, it rained for our whole vacation, and is my father mad? He said some things about you that people are not supposed to say, but I hope you will not hurt him anyway. Your friend, but I'm not going to tell you who I am. <laughs> or, uh, or this one. Dear God, I didn't think that orange went with purple until I saw the sunset you made on Tuesday. That was cool. Love, Eugene. But this morning as we look at Psalm 37 and some of the issues it's going to raise, I spent some time looking through the chapter of Children's Letters to God entitled Fervent Wishes, Suggestions, and Complaints. See, that's where you find prayers like this. Dear God, please send Dennis Clark to a different camp this year. Peter. Dear God, my brother is a rat. You should give him a tail. Ha <laughs> ha. Danny. Or this one, dear God, if we come back as something, please don't let me be Jennifer Horton because I hate her. <laughs> Denise. Now all of these would fit well into a genre of psalms called the imprecatory psalms. The imprecatory psalms, and I know that's a mouthful. So let me unpack a little bit about what that means. The imprecatory psalms are those in which the author imprecates. See, that clears it up, doesn't it? Actually, no, it doesn't. Imprecatory means these are psalms where the author calls down calamity or destruction, God's anger and judgment on his enemies. For example, Psalm 17, 13, Rise up, O Lord, confront them, bring them down with your sword, rescue me from the wicked. Psalm 58, 6, O God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, Lord. Psalm 79, 6 and 7, Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name, for they have devoured Jacob and devastated his homeland. They are rats and you should give them all tales. Psalm 79, 6 and 7, that part wasn't in there. And maybe the most famous of all, or infamous one, is the one that the psalmist wrote uh, in the midst of the exile of God's people to Babylon. When Babylon came in and uh, just burned Jerusalem to the ground and took the best and the brightest of the generation off into captivity in, in Babylon, and in Psalm 137, the one that starts off, by the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept, it went on to say, O oh, daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, blessed shall be he who repays you for what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Yeah, now I hope none of us have gotten to the point of dashing against the rocks anger toward those that we perceive to be our enemies. But you don't have to look very far to know that we live in a culture that seems to be addicted to outrage. Everyone seems to be angry at somebody else. 
Think about the new phrases that have come into our vocabulary in the past few years. Road rage, tweet storm, clap back. All of these are signs that we long to go after those we perceive to be our enemies on social media, on I-65, in the parking lot in Walmart when two people are fighting over a handicapped spot and neither one of them has a tag for it, I should add. Part of it is when we see so much evil in the world, so much injustice, and we wonder why nothing changes. I heard this from a member of the Prattville Police Department earlier in this week. He said, James, in my job, I see so much of the worst of human nature. And I know God wins in the end, but it's hard to not become cynical. Or this from a high school student. How come the jerks are the most popular? Or this from the mother of an eight-year-old girl. My daughter tries to be nice to people and she gets rejected and made fun of by the cool kids because of it. See, this is why we have those imprecatory psalms in the first place. I think that they exist because God knew he needed to let us know that it was okay to feel that way sometimes. That it is part of human emotions and God gave us the, motion, the emotions that he gave us. That it's okay to say, God, I just pray that you would smite my enemies today. Why isn't there more smiting in our world today? But I also think that that's why he put Psalm 37 in there as well. As an antidote for our imprecatories as an antidote for our desire to see God just lay out our enemies. And so if you're physically able, I would invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word this morning as we look at Psalm chapter 37. We're not going to read all of it, but I do want to read the first eight verses of it, and then we're going to skip down a bit. Psalm 37, beginning in verse 1. Fret not yourself because of evildoers, be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the man who prospers in his way, over the one who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Now skip down to verse 23. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he falls, he will not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his children begging for bread. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated, and as you're seated, would you pray with me? God, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for the power of your word. God, I want to thank you for your sense of justice because it is so much better than my sense of justice. And God, help us to all keep that in mind this morning. Because we live in a world where we're waiting for justice to be done. We live in a world where we're waiting for your hand, and we are waiting for you to act. Help us to know how to wait well. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. So four things to do while we wait for God's justice in the world. Number one, number one, the first thing to do is chill. Say that with me. Chill. Verse 1, verse 7, verse 8. If you were listening as we read the scripture, you heard one command repeated three times. And that command was fret not. Verse 1, fret not because of evildoers. Verse 7, fret not yourself over the man who prospers in his way. Verse 8, fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. The verb translated fret here 
is used 90 times in the Old Testament. Often it's translated kindled 44 times, hot 10 times, incensed 2 times, burn 1 time. What do all these words have in common? They all have something to do with heat. So what's the first thing that we do when we're faced with evildoers? Chill. Now this doesn't mean you give up the right or the responsibility to speak out against injustice. Jesus himself uh, became incensed when he saw the money changers in the temple. Jesus himself fashioned a cord out of whips and drove the money changers out of the temple because he saw that God's house was being used for something other than what God's house was built for. So it doesn't mean you give up the right or the privilege or the responsibility of speaking speaking out against injustice. But notice that in all three of these instances, it's not talking about getting angry, about not getting angry and not getting indignant over evil. Look closely. It doesn't say fret not because of evil. It says fret not because of evil doers. You see the difference? See, the more we put our trust in God, the more we are able to chill because we understand that justice ultimately belongs to God. And so we don't have to see the evildoer as our enemy. We can see the evil as the enemy, but have compassion on the evil doer and we'll get more we'll get to that more in just a minute number two after chill number two is do uh, sorry <laughs> you got that part okay so number two do the do's do the do's one of the most helpful ways to study psalm 37 is to keep track of all of the commands in the psalm and even better than just keeping track keep track over which of them are negative commands telling you not to do something and which of them are positive commands telling you to do something so let's watch how this shakes out we're going to make this audience participation this morning i'm going to read the command and you tell me if it goes into the positive uh, column these things that we do or the negative column these things that we don't do or these things that we avoid doing number one fret not yourself negative or positive that's a negative that's something that you don't do be not envious of wrongdoers negative or positive negative very good trust in the Lord positive that's something that we do how about do good very good dwell in the land very good. Befriend faithfulness. What does that mean, by the way? I think it means that when we dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness, we make up our mind that we're going to be part of this society. We're not going to separate ourselves. We're not going to run off to a monastery. We're not going to build a fortress and a moat around our church so that we can protect ourselves from the big bad world. We're going to dwell in the land. We're going to realize these are the people that we live with. This, this is the culture that we live in. This is where we are to be salt and light. And we can't do that if we just stay in the salt shaker. So we dwell in the land. We befriend faithfulness. What does that mean? I think it means that in this wicked and, and evil world, we make it a, a point to befriend faithfulness. We do not lose our faithfulness, our commitment, our hope, our optimism in the world. We don't let ourselves become cynical at the way that the world is declining. So we dwell in the land, we, do, we, we make up our minds that we're not just going to go and join a church softball league with a bunch of other Christians, we're going to be on a softball league, hopefully on a team with a bunch of pagans, where we can be salt and light. We're going to let our kids play on soccer teams and we're going to, uh, we're going to be on the soccer fields uh, in the stands with parents who may not go to church because we're going to dwell in the land. You befriend faithfulness, you stay faithful to your Christian conviction so that dwelling in the land doesn't pull you down. Okay, what about delight, in your, delight yourself in the Lord? Positive or negative? Positive. Commit your way to the Lord. Positive or negative? Positive. Be still before the Lord. Positive. Wait patiently on Him. Positive. Refrain from anger. 
negative, okay? Forsake wrath. Okay, that sounds negative, and so does the next one, turn from evil. But I would put both of those on the positive side. See, when you refrain from anger, that's just making a choice, I'm not going to do that. But to forsake wrath means I'm going to turn away from that and go into a different direction. To turn from evil, I might have been going down this road that I know is evil, that I know is destructive, that I know is hateful, that I know dishonors somebody else made in the image of God, and I'm going to turn the other way. So I think that those two are positive. What about keep his way? Positive. It means obey God's command. What about mark the blameless and observe the upright? Positive and positive. This means that we follow godly examples. We look at the people in our church, in our community, and we say, okay, that guy, that woman, that's a godly woman, and I want to model my life after her. I want to model my life after him. That's one of the reasons that deacon ordination is such a big deal. Because we got two men that we're going to ordain uh, this evening that have basically said we we want to serve as examples of the church. So we mark the blameless. We observe the upright. So you see that there's basically 12 positives compared to just three negatives. That's four to one. What does that tell you? Here's the point. The list of do's is way bigger than the list of don'ts. A lot of people think that Christianity is just a whole bunch of don'ts, a whole bunch of things that you can't do. You can't go here. You can't go there. We don't smoke. We don't chew. We don't go with girls that do, right? But you look at this list. It is the do's that characterize Christianity. And one way to to think about it is this. If you spend your time doing the do's, you're not going to have time to do the don'ts. And if you could, you wouldn't, so you can't, so you don't, so chill. Right? Christianity is not just a list of don'ts. It's a list of do's. So, number two, do the do's. Number three, believe the buts. Verses 9 through 13, there's three pairs of phrases that contrast the wicked with the righteous. Verses 9 through 11, we learn that the wicked seem to be in charge, but... The righteous will prevail, for the evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more, though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked seem to be in charge, but their time is short, but their time is running out. The righteous will prevail. Number two, the wicked plot against the righteous, but the righteous are protected. The wicked plots against the righteous, this is verse 12, and gnashes his teeth at him, but the Lord laughs at the wicked. He sees their day is coming. The righteous are protected, even though the wicked plot against them. We need to understand that we will face persecution. We will. First Peter says, all those who desire to follow godly lives will be persecuted. Doesn't matter what laws are enacted to protect our religious liberty. The Bible promises that all those who desire to live godly lives will be persecuted. But ultimately, the righteous are protected. Here's the third but. The wicked will be destroyed, but The righteous will be upheld. Verse 17, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. There's some crucial things to remember about these contrasts. The first is that righteousness always prevails. We've seen the end of the book. In a couple weeks, we're going to start up our study of Revelation again on Sunday nights. We've been studying that book of Revelation. We took a break for the summer. Now we're going to come back to it. But the dominant theme in the book of Revelation is that God wins. There's going to be some scary times that the church has to go through. But we've seen the end of the book. That's why ESPN Classic is such a popular channel because you can go back and you can watch your favorite football game or your favorite basketball game and you can know even though there were some tense moments when it was live, 
you know the end of the story. You know the final score. And if you don't like that final score, you don't watch that one. But if you're an Auburn fan, there's a certain game that you watch. Because you know that in the last second, everything's going to turn around. And so you can relax, you can chill, because you know the end of the game. If you're a Virginia basketball fan, there's a certain Auburn basketball game that you watch because you know in the, in the last point three seconds, everything turned around. I don't watch that one. But we know the end of the game. And so we can take courage in that. We can believe the buts. But there's something even more important to keep in mind here. And that is what defines the righteous and the wicked. Understand this. What defines the righteous and the wicked is not political affiliation, voting record, skin color, citizenship status, police record, or first language. The righteous and the wicked are distinguished by one simple difference. One of them knows the Lord. One of them knows doesn't the righteous have surrendered their lives to jesus the wicked have not that means that somebody can be blood-bought and redeemed and still a jerk it also means that someone can be the nicest most moral person that you've ever met and still be lost in their sins one is wicked and one is righteous it means that the most ardent red state conservative republican who lines up with you on every single political issue could still be considered wicked by god's standards and the most liberal blue state green new deal democrat if he has surrendered his life to the lordship of, of christ has been pronounced righteous by that same standard. Now, it doesn't mean there's not significant issues that we disagree on. The Bible has to be our basis for what we believe about the sanctity of human life. The definition of marriage as being between one man and one woman forever. The security of our borders. The Bible has to be the basis for those conversations. But it also has to be the basis for our conversations about what we believe about our responsibility for the environment. How to minister to the foreigner and to the alien. How to respond to violence. How to work for racial reconciliation. How to judge the character of our elected officials. The difference between the righteous and the wicked is not how they vote, but who they have surrendered their life to. Too often we write off the other side with statements like, I just don't see how anyone could claim to be a Christian and believe blank. Or I don't see how anybody could vote for blank and still be a Christian. So when you meet somebody who does, listen. Go back to Scripture. Talk about Scripture. Talk about the verses that they're citing. Talk about the verses that you're citing. Let that be the basis for conversation between Christians. 1 Peter 3.15, always have an answer for the hope that is within you. But do it with gentleness and respect. Do it with gentleness and respect. What about those who don't claim to be Christian? Then understand this. Enemies of the gospel are not your enemy. They are captives of your enemy. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they are kept from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, which is the image of God. How much does it change your perspective of somebody when you realize they're blind? How much does it change your perspective of somebody when you realize they are a prisoner of war and not an enemy combatant? It changes everything. 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us who our adversary is. It says our adversary is the devil. And he prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And if he can get you so consumed with hatred of the other, guess what? He's made a meal out of you and he's coming back for more. So what do you do? While you're waiting for God's justice, while you're waiting for the end of the game, number four you counter-program. You counter-program. Twice in this psalm, God's people are told to do good. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Verse 27, turn away from evil and do good. So shall you dwell forever. 
Now, does this mean just a generic doing good, as in pay your taxes, help little old ladies across the street, take in stray dogs, that kind of good? Well, yes, but is that all? And I think the answer is no. Let's think about what the rest of the Bible says specifically about doing good to those who oppose you. In the Sermon on the Mount, chapter, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven, who makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. This is what I mean by counter-programming. We're getting more and more conditioned to hitting back when we get hit. That if someone insults us, we feel duty-bound to return insult for insult, to torch them right back on social media. But as Christians, we don't get to fight the way the world fights. We just don't. The weapons of our warfare are something else entirely. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. To counter-program means to deliberately say no to the very human impulse to ratchet up the hostilities and differences, and instead to make peace. We follow the example of Jesus whose final miracle on this earth was to reattach the ear of one of the soldiers who came to arrest him. You know, if there was ever anybody who had the absolute moral high ground to call down curses on his enemies, it would have been Jesus. Instead, what did he do? From the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And in so doing, he made peace between God and those who were enemies of God. Who were the enemies of God? We were. Paul said, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Jesus fed us with his body. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of this bread will never go hungry. Paul says, if your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. Jesus said, I'm the living water, come and drink from me. Paul said, in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And that was the part that always confused me. Because it sounds like Paul's saying, see, this is how you get vengeance. You just make them feel so guilty because you're so nice to them that it's going to be like burning coals on their head. What does that mean? Do you remember the story of Isaiah in the temple? Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah saw a vision of the holy God, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And there's seraphs on one and the other side of him with six wings. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah was so overwhelmed by God's glory and his sovereignty that he cried out. He said, woe is me. I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the, among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah didn't cry out and say, finally, it's about time. Smite my enemies now. Finally, it's about time. Here's the Lord, high and exalted. Go after the Amalekites. Go after the other Orites. Isaiah pointed the finger to himself and said, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. What does this have to do with a burning coal? What does this have to do with heaping burning coals on his head? Well, remember that in the vision, there's seraphim, mighty angelic beings circling the throne. And look at what happened next. 
one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Is it possible that when we see our enemy and we feed him, when we see our enemy and give him clothes to drink, <laughs> clothes to drink, what in the world, and we give him something to drink, is it possible that when the Bible says, in so doing, you will heap burning coals on their head, maybe that's the thing that's going to make them aware of their own sin. Maybe that's the thing that's going to make them aware of just how, for, how far, far they fall short of God's glory. And maybe that burning coal isn't a symbol of revenge. Maybe it's a symbol of being cleansed by the love of God, just as it was for Isaiah that seraph came and put a live coal, a burning coal on his lips and says, this has touched your mouth. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. When we love our enemies instead of praying that God will call down curses on them, perhaps we can lead them to the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ just as we all have been. We all once were enemies with God but through the blood of Jesus, God has brought us back to himself. And when we choose to love, when we choose to fret not, when we choose to believe in God's ultimate justice, we can bring a lost and dying world back into reconciliation with God the Father. Would you pray with me?